magnify your name above the heavens, above the earth, on the first and second heavens, even as you are gloriously seated on your throne in the third heavens. Have your way, Lord, and let your hand of mercy spread over the earth rim. And Lord, we pray that no one appointed for salvation shall die before time because of the ravages of this uh, virus that is ravaging the world. We pray that you have mercy for the sake of your church. And Lord, we pray that you will cause your church to rise up and stand in the gap. And your name will be glorified. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Holy Spirit, now take us through the orientation today. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen. Brothers and sisters, today's orientation note and what is the orientation? We spend a month to prepare those who would be part of the 2020 masterclass. It's the way we start the year. We spend a month preparing people for a nine-month intense teaching, training, equipping, activation, and release process. Nine months. Nine months. And so one month to prepare you for nine months is not a bad idea. It enables you to know who we are, the visionaries, the Lord has committed this assignment to the trust. It also enables you to know what is the program all about? What is the intrinsic what are the intrinsic issues? What are the what is the theological basis of the assignment? What is revelation? And that's why we're doing what we're doing. The orientation is to get to you to that point. And today's orientation note is number 12, the process of betting the Melchizedek priesthood worldwide. Before we go into that, I'd like to remind you, yesterday in London, every Thursday, we release a word to the Global School of Ministry. And in the teaching on divine perspective of purpose, yesterday the Lord led us to discuss the, the responsive church of sons of Elohim, because in the divine perspective of purpose, one of the key themes is this. The Lord doesn't want us to have four negative relationships with him. He doesn't want us to be babes, perpetual babes, an arrested baby who's syndrome, or ever learning, never able to come knowledge of truth, always drinking milk and wanting encouragement only. He doesn't want us, number two, to be like strangers who do not know him intimately, strangers who are far from him. He also doesn't want us to be like, you know, uh, people who are uh, unwilling slaves in a relationship with him. And he doesn't want us in any way to be people who are distant from him, who are not intimate with him. He doesn't want us to be people who are ever learning, never able to come to knowledge of the truth. He doesn't want us to be people whose relationship with him is defined by distance and defined by fear and, and anxiety and worry. And so, men of brethren, the Lord wants all of us to grow from babes where we start the new birth experience, to grow, to, 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 to serve him, to grow, to love him and be intimate with him, friends with him, to grow and become sons of Elohim. And sonship enables us to be priests in a way that is different from the world. And I'm going to come to that in a moment. But when we are sons, we take responsibility for the estate of our father. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 tells us, you know, that he created us in his image and likeness to exercise dominion over the earth on his behalf. So we cannot be irresponsible. We cannot be unresponsive. We cannot think that happen. This coronavirus is ravaging the earth. Well, uh, you know, we can't even gloat about it. We are not of them that gloat in a moment of misery and pain. No, we stand in the gap in prayer. We intercede. We pray for those appointed for salvation. They will not die before their time. We also pray the Lord will cause this, the, those in the laboratories to provide, you know, vaccines for the, uh, for, to, to arrest this thing. We pray as long as the earth is, the church is on earth, as long as the church has not been raptured, there should never come in time we lose compassion. There should never come a time we lose our capacity to love even the sinners. Men and brethren were to represent the Lord. What will Yeshua do? Will he say, oh, serve them right? No, he won't do that. 
brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you to go and watch the video released last night. The teaching is a brief one, 35 minutes. And I say this to you, it will challenge your theology. We're in the world, we're not of the world. We have responsibility. The Church of Sons of Elohim is a church that takes responsibility for its environment until the day when the sound of the trumpet and the dead in Yeshua will rise. You know, in the last few days, I've been in the book of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, all of the five chapters, 2 Thessalonians, and you know, in chapter 1, I mean, 1 Thessalonians 1, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 13, and to 18, it tells us the day of the rapture, we who are alive will not prevent, that will not precede those who are dead. They will rise first. Then we will rise. That day has not come yet. Until that day, we've got to take responsibility. We've got to be responsive. And I want to encourage you, watch that video and go and do according to that. Above all things, all these things tell us that, behold, he's coming indeed. Watch. Pray, occupy. Let's get the work done. Whatever the Lord created us for, whatever the Lord created you for, discover it, pursue it, fulfill it. Three things. Discover, pursue, fulfill. What he created you for, that's what will give meaning to life. It's not drink. It's not food. It's not houses. It's not cars. It is divine purpose when you discover and pursue. And in the process of fulfilling, that's where satisfaction comes from. I haven't said that, man and brethren, we need to know that it is the Lord's plan. One thing the Lord did, we told you Psalm 110 verse 4, the promise of the Father to Yeshua, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And Yeshua came on earth. He didn't just come to die to save us. He didn't just come to announce the kingdom. He didn't just come to pay the price for people to enter the kingdom. He came to inaugurate a new type of priesthood on earth. He came to fulfill the Aaronic priesthood, the one given to Aaron, the son of Levi, the Levitical priesthood. He came to fulfill it because it was moderator of the old covenant. He came to inaugurate the new priesthood, uh, I mean the new covenant, and the new covenant needed a new type of priesthood. And he came to inaugurate it. Amen and brethren, that's one of the things he came to do on earth, to inaugurate. If you don't understand this principle, you will never understand the Global School of Ministry. You will never understand the Global Advanced Mentorship Program because this is something that is at the heart of all that we do is to produce resources that are made available that anybody, anywhere, any minister, anywhere using these resources will be able to transition the church from an organization to an organism, organism to from the priesthood of uh, Nimrodic patterns where a man owns the church and owns the people and owns their money to the one where a priest serves the people. So from what where is organization, as in the Levitical play principle, where people enter the building and <coughs> join organizations, and the organization owes the people to one in which all of us are organic parts of the body, each of us having a responsibility, each of us releasing a grace. Men and brethren, that is why the polite epistles are particularly important in the process because it's in the polite epistles that the understanding of the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, the functional relevance of it to the body concept of the church is articulated. So the polite epistles show us, number one, the centrality of Yeshua as a bridge between Yahweh the Father and humanity. Number two, it shows us the reality that everyone in Yeshua is uniquely gifted to release and receive the virtue activated and propelled by the indwelling Holy Spirit. So, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 8. First Corinthians, the whole of chapter 12. First Corinthians 13, which talks about love as the glue. First Corinthians 14 talks about order in use of the gifts. Then the book of Ephesians chapter 4 Verse 7, all the way down to verse 16. And men and brethren, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. When you put these things together, you get a picture 
of the church as an organic entity, an organism of body parts, each one activated to function. And that is the kind of priesthood Yeshua wants to inaugurate in the earth realm, one in which every believer understands the assignment, every believer embraces the assignment, every believer does the assignment, and it takes the process, salvation through preaching, then those who are saved are discipled, and they are discipled to come from believing on him, to become followers of him, and they serve him, and they grow in grace. Their relationship, like we said before, become intimate like friends, and they grow in grace to the place where they are sons of Elohim. And anyone who does not grow to become a son of Elohim, and yet is in ministry, is going to substantially mess up the purpose of the Father. You will not see the need to understand the miracles of the priesthood. It will be like Greek to you. Men and brethren, these revelations have been articulated to become the curriculum of the Global School of Ministry, and that is what the Global Advanced Mentorship Program uses in training. The idea is to provide leaders, ministries, and congregations whose hearts are inclined to know and do the will of Yahweh a simple, spiritually empirical process to ensure that the saints committed to their trust emerge as sustainable and organic kingdom communities of priests and kings after the order of Melchizedek. What do they do? They minister to others and receive ministry from others so that by whatever joy supplies, the body makes increase of itself in love. As Ephesians 4, 15 and 16 says, we grow up into him and into each other. And so the vision of Global School of Ministry and Global Advanced Mentorship Program is about igniting, catalyzing the emergence of the Melchizedek priesthood of all sins as a worldwide reality. That's what we're about. It's one of the overarching purposes. And there are a lot of people who take the global school of ministry to use it to go and further their normal, what they normally do old. They don't understand this overarching principle. So they find it difficult to empower saints to become priests. At times they train saints. But to commission them to serve, they want to hold them. No, they don't want them to go. They don't want them to leave. And this is a very terrible spirit. So people want to use it to foster what they used to know. No, the Lord says open. Be open to understand the principle. Understand the theology behind what we do is that the Lord has called all believers. All believers. And so if you are in the Nimrodic system of owning people, owning their property, owning their money, and you rule them, you will, you will be running a contradiction of sorts with the global school of ministry. If you believe in the Levitical system where human beings have to wear robes and rings and accoutrements of power and people bow before them, call them my Lord and my, your, my, your grace and all that, and you want to run that system, you want to retain it and still want to use global school of ministry, it's going to be a contradiction in terms. Men and brethren, the Lord wants us to know the church should function in a particular way on this side of eternity to qualify for its eternal role when it returns. Look at what the Lord told the churches, you know, in Revelation chapter 1, when he was speaking unto uh, the church at, um, uh, I mean, when John was introducing Yeshua, John, Revelation 1, 4, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Yeshua, who is a faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth. Take note of that. One of his titles is prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and have made us kings and priests unto Elohim and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. And in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 and 10, in verse 10, he says, He has made us unto our Elohim, kings and priests, and we shall reign on earth. So we need to understand that when the Melchizedek priesthood, which is what he came to inaugurate, is embraced, ministries experience 
a spiritual stability which comes from Elohim in spite of external attacks. And this is because unlike the Levitical and Nimrodic systems, the specific vessel to whom the vision of a ministry or local conviction is committed, he or she understands that he has a role or she has a role to play. And that vessel is under divine impulsion to be invested in building up all parts of the body. So that the vision of the head, Yeshua, is achieved. So he doesn't build people into himself. He doesn't go about making them codependent. If they have headache, they have to consult him. They need food, they have to consult him. Everything, they have to consult him. That may look nice, but it only ends up making people codependent. It makes people strangers to Elohim. It makes people unable to see Elohim. All they see is the man of God, the woman of God for every need. And this is an important principle. So those who are vision holders or pastors of congregations, they create systems whereby people get to know their father and get to be able to approach him. And it is matters that need extra help. They call upon the leadership. And things are structured in such a way that it doesn't revolve on a man or woman. It's spread. Apostles do apostolic work. Prophets do prophetic work. Evangelists do evangelistic work. Pastors do pastoral work. Teachers do teaching work. And when everybody is in their own lane, the church is organic, not organizational. And when it is so, there's strong stability. All this fear of people who break away, do this, do that, that happens in organizational churches where once you can grab a certain number of people, you create your own church. Once you can displace the leader, have enough people in the committee to vote out the leader, you take over. Those things cannot happen in a Melchizedek priesthood because the leadership is Yeshua. Evidently so. And everybody's in their lane. So you cannot, as a, as a teacher or as a pastor, want to do, uh, do the work of the apostle. It's not given to you. You don't have the grace to do it. Men and brethren, that's why there is no disorder in Melchizedek priesthoods. And wherever there is any, there is spiritual solution. In Romans 16, 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. And it's not only here. When I was studying Thessalonians this today, he also talked about those to avoid. You know, so Christian leaders who are afraid to implement the vision of Yeshua for a royal priesthood are without a shadow of doubt living in either dangerous, blissful ignorance or outright disobedience. And it is not our job to cherry pick which one to obey or what not to obey. The whole world will obey it. And his word is that he has made us a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, and we should show for the praise of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so, men and brethren, it's so important that we should be able to know. Can you picture a world where an uncountable number of saints across the world, across Asia, Africa, North America, South America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, where every saint is being taught, trained, equipped, activated, and released to serve the Lord. Not just within the four walls of the brick and mortar, but anywhere and everywhere in the community. Can you imagine a world where every believer is functioning in the fullness of grace? Can you imagine a situation where Christian leaders and ministries become instruments through which prayer of King Yeshua is fulfilled? What prayer? Matthew 937. Then said the other disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that will send for laborers into the harvest. Men and brethren, can you imagine what will happen when we are truly about this? Every minister is creating ministers. Every minister is invested in creating ministers. In other words, Listen to this. A successful ministry is not one which accumulates a crowd of milk-drinking babes who are spectators or dormant laity on the pew needing regular injection of high-octane preaching to stir their souls. A successful ministry is rather one in which all brethren have the opportunity and the facility to be empowered to discover and function in the royal priesthood callings. And men and brethren, that is why we got to know these things. 
Global School of Ministry, the curriculum is supposed to create value for these seven types of people. Number one, Christians who know Yeshua experientially through the new birth experience and they love him enough to respond to his call for more laborers to participate in his harvest. Number two, there may already be there may be people who are already full-time ministers or part-time ministers in various denominations may realize that they are hamstrung by limited understanding of Elohim and his word and yet for more intimate relationship with him such people, if they come to the school of ministry, if they embrace the curriculum, there will be a transformation. And if they roll for the master class, there will be there basically a transformation. Number three, there may be church workers and officers who realize the lack of training has hampered them from being as effective in the hands of the Lord as they should. Number four, there may also be believers who are rusty in the pews due to lack of engagement with their gifts and callings and come to realize that they must give account to Yeshua the day he returns. They therefore want to be prepared to engage in ministry at the level Elohim who created and redeemed them ordained. Number five, they may be young or new Christians who love the Lord so much that he yields to his properties to serve them. Number six, the curriculum is also recommended for adoption by congregations and ministries who understand the need to train those who work with the visionary or pastor. If there are people who work with the visionary or pastor, they need to be trained. They, they, they not just do whatever they want to do. And that's why we say to pastors, you can enroll for the master class or the yes course. The master class enrollment has finished the last day of February, okay? So right now, you can't enroll for the master class as in the classroom on Facebook, but you can enroll for the classroom called the yes course even if one million people are there, that's fine. It's a system. Technology has been deployed. So you can go to the website, www.kingdombusclub.com and look for the top where it says Yes Course. Click there, fill out the form, and you are in. Number seven, the curriculum is especially useful for training saints in the marketplace and civil society. You see, the gospel is not a come here proposition, but a go you want. The church is not called to hide within four walls of brick and mortar seeking to touch lives of those who come in. The ta that tendency leads to principles of escapism with dim light of the church and takes away the flavor of Yeshua. Like right now, some churches are, you know, they are told not to, it doesn't bother them, but okay, we're in a Goshen, and so the world can go to places. No, that's not the mind of the Father. The church is called to engage with its contemporary society as a salt which has value by catalyzing images of better taste or flavor as well as an agent of preserving the environment from corruption. It's also to serve as a light which dispels darkness on worldly culture as Matthew 5, 13 to 16 says. So the, the vision of Yeshua is therefore best fulfilled when saints who are in business, the professions, civil service, public service, government and community affairs understand that they are truly in ministry as ambassadors of the king to whom they owe ultimate allegiance. This curriculum will deliver that outcome by his grace. So brothers and sisters, listen, you may be in one of these seven categories this curriculum is for you. And notwithstanding where a participant is in the journey of faith, he or she will profit greatly from a condensed, intensive spiritual formation exercise. For Global School of Ministry, pastors are at liberty to set the pace at which they want the congregation to complete. Same, you know, the model developed at Arise Metropolitan Assembly in Elm Park Home Church, London, is that all members of the congregation are encouraged to invest two and a half hours on Sunday evening. After church, they wait. 30 minutes refreshment, then they spend about two hours together studying. Then on Thursday, about two hours, and we believe that within 18 to 24 months, that's one and a half to two years of doing this, four hours on Sunday, two hours on Thursday, that is a typical learning circle. It's not fixed. It could be more, it could be less. It all depends on how participants are in you know, invested in studying. 
because during that period of time, they were exposed to a body of knowledge listed in the curriculum. And more than the body of knowledge, however, participants are challenged to have an experiential knowledge of Yahweh as a father and grow in intimacy with Yeshua as sovereign Lord during this critical period of their lives. Moreover, brothers and sisters, ministries and congregations which embrace and install the Global School of Ministry program are at liberty to determine how long their training circle should be based on their peculiar needs. A pastor knows the peculiar needs of the congregation committed to his trust. And so while we recommend that each week you should spend between four to six hours or a single day, like a Saturday, you could spend all that together. There are those who may prefer less hours or more hours. Do as the Lord persuades you. The key thing is to take the curriculum, stick to it, choose days of fellowship agreed, and deliver it. Men and brethren, Yeshua, our Lord, he spent three and a half years teaching, training, equipping, activating, and then releasing them in the three and a half years. So ministries are liberty to use online platforms such as Facebook groups, Facebook live video, conference calls, Skype, YouTube, Periscope, Ustream, to implement the training. Apostle Sunday in London, the Redeemer Assemblies Trust, he trains people in London through Skype. Um, you know, some other people use technology different ways. The teaching and training resources are free of Babylonian copyright rules or restrictions if you are indeed using it for training. But please don't use them to publish books because then that would be a crime, a crime to claim what is not yours, okay? We say use it. Teach, train, equip, activate, and release people to serve the Lord. For the master class, we believe that 40 weeks or nine months is deemed sufficient time to impart revelation knowledge of the Holy Scriptures, activate dominant gifts and callings, as well as give the sword of the Spirit scope to perform necessary surgery in the heart and mind of those who sincerely open to dealings of the world. Now, one of the things we say in the Global School of Music curriculum is that there should, everybody should be able to do self-assessment. And in a master class, everybody should be able to do self-assessment. Now, there are several benchmarks of self-assessment. Number one, the level of intimacy with the Lord achieved over the training period. Are you more intimate with the Lord? Do you sense that happening? You've been, if you're in a program for one month or two or three, do you sense more intimacy with the Lord in your relationship? Number two, how much you place quest for the kingdom and his righteousness above all other things, including your personal well-being. Other things you need. How much do you place the kingdom? Where do you place it? Number three, how tender your heart is becoming. Are you becoming more tender, more sensitive? Number four, how holy yielded they are to Yeshua as king? Have you come to the place where you are now yielded to him? Five, your attitude to challenges of life and actions, reactions of other people. What are your challenge? What is your attitude to challenges of life? When challenges of life come, how do you handle them? It tells you how you are growing indeed inside. Number six, quality of your stewardship of divine blessings. When God gives you money, position, title, whatever he gives you, property, how do you see it? Do you see it as your own to spend anyhow, to use anyhow, or do you see yourself as a steward of that blessing? If you're able to see yourself as a steward, not as an owner, and that therefore you call upon the Lord to show you what to do, to lead you by spirit and how to utilize those things, blessings, you know that truly you are growing. Number seven, how much do you place your faith in Yahweh as a father, hope in him and love for him and his sins. How far are they growing? These things are indicators as to what is going on in you. And so, men and brethren, I want to remind you that what we do in the Global School of Music curriculum is encapsulated in what is called the TTF process. You've heard it before, and you'll hear it again and again until it sinks in. 
Some people say experts have said you have to say something eight times. Some say no, it is actually 16 times. In any case, there are some themes we are going to repeat throughout this training. If you understand those themes, it will help you. So the teacher process stands for the first one is T. What do we mean by T? Teach every saint. What do you teach them? Teach them the constitution of the kingdom, what is the Holy Bible. A systematic understanding of the Holy Scriptures is the basis of making disciples out of believers, as Matthew 28, 19, and 20 says. So understanding, rightly applying the rightly divided word when preaching and teaching is the most secure insurance against errors so that our faith stands on truth, not on emotions, not on subjective interpretations of movements or denominations. When the truth is properly understood, it put, settles you in the Lord. Number two T is train the believer to the degree that after a circle of time, he or she joins the harvest work for the work of ministry. Now, men and brethren, training is affected when teaching is systematically affected during a, a learning circle with clear attainable outcomes. You know, words, there's a difference between teaching and training. Teaching, you teach the Bible. There's no beginning, there's no end other than start from Genesis to Revelation. It could take you 50 years to teach, 100 years to teach. Teaching is open, but training is not that open. Training starts somewhere and somewhere. Maybe one year circle, two year circle, three year circle. When you take teaching and bring it into an orderly presentation of certain amount of truth that will produce an outcome, that is training. Three, equipping. Equip them with a proper understanding of Elohim. People need to be equipped to understand Elohim. They need to understand the church. They need to understand the world. They need to understand the devil. They need to understand their true kingdom identity, who they are in Yeshua Jesus and who he is in them. They need to overcome the, they need to understand these things in order to overcome all odds. We have to equip them with what it takes to succeed in what he has called them to be and to do so that they can optimally contribute their quota to the building up of the body. And the equipping process best takes place when training is brought down to the personal level. When leaders or trainers engage one-on-one -on -one with saints as individuals, not a group. In other words, leaders and pastors need to find space to attend to the role brethren as individuals needing care, which is peculiar to them. In a master class, this is part of the function of principal officers and mentors assigned to assist the visionaries. That's part of their work. From time to time, we check up into the classroom, we look up one person or the other, ask them questions, but the main work of equipping is now devolved to the principal officers and the mentors so that they can do and they can engage one-on-one. -on -one. So take your mentor seriously. The one assigned to you has been through the program and is in a place to help you to come alongside you. Please embrace the assignment. Then the fourth one is activate. Activate the gifts of Holy Spirit. Most times the gifts of Holy Spirit are lying dormant or latent in people. And all the graces he placed at their Elohim places at the disposal, they are lying there, at times constrained by ignorance or inaction. Activation takes place by identification of the gifts. For instance, if a leader says to somebody, I see there's a prophetic flow in you. You know what? If it's true, that word the leader spoke activates something. The baby in the womb jumps up. So activation takes place when there's affirmation, when there's identification by of the leader or affirmation of the same by their leader, it can take place by prophetic utterance or release or revelatory confirmations of what is in them and by laying on of hands. That's why in a Christian church, you don't every Sunday, you lay hands to cast out demons. You make a mockery of the faith. You lay hands to activate gifts and callings. It's a much more superior thing to activate people in the gifts and callings so that they can be who they are called to be and do what the Lord has called them to be to do. Don't go about looking for demons in people who are born against spirit field. Demons can attack but not possess. 
people who are born again, spirit filled. Don't give people a wrong theology that makes them dependent on you every time they want to run around and fall under the anointing and their hair, you know, their fake hair runs this way, their wig runs that way, them that way, you are filming them and having joy. No, that's not a sign of maturity. Number five, release. What does release mean? Release them into productive ministry as co laborers with Yeshua and with yourself. And men and brethren, the laborers we are praying for. The Lord opened our eyes. The laborers, pastors are praying for. Oh Lord, send us laborers. Send us laborers. You know what the Lord said? They are right there in the pews of Christian congregations, labeled as laity. And release takes place when leaders who are secure in their own callings, they willingly create space for the saints they have trained to function as ministers without fear of being outshone. If anybody has healing gift and you don't have it, praise the Lord, give him space, let them come, encourage them. In our rise to the assembly, we have what we call body ministry. Every Sunday, after the preaching of the word, is 30 minutes. If you have a prophetic word, get up and release it. If you have a healing anointing, go up and impart it. If you have a word for anyone, go to that person, give it. We say to people, you don't need to be filled with this, the, the, the disease called microphonitis. You don't need microphone to impart a healing gift in a local congregation. Go and do it. Go around. Touch lives. Touch. Impart grace. Men and brethren, when people are released, they shouldn't go and sit down doing nothing. No. Either one of these days I'm going to find the, the program, the, the, the weekly schedule of the Rise Metropolitan Assembly and show you how it is structured so that we have what we call an organic church structure. One in which everybody does something, the leaders as well as the brethren, everyone. I'm going to find one of the days. You know, it's organic. You can see it just looking at a piece of paper. People are encouraged. To impart grace. Nobody should be intimidated. If people have a, a deliverance gift you don't have as a leader, let them do it. Men and brethren, and if they are wise, they won't go try to draw people to themselves. They won't have an absolute spirit and try to create their own ministry within the ministry. No, that's unfaithfulness. Men and brethren, it's so important that we come to a place where there will be people who the Lord, you know, will give such grace you know, and they're able to pastor, give them the enablement to go ahead and plant the, the churches, congregations of the same ministry. You know, right now we have Pastor Moody and Pastor Norbert. For some time they've been going to up minister and the whole church backs them up. Evangelism, that through the evangelism, they'll plant a living church in up minister because the two of them have capacity to do that. If we find another one or two people, praise the Lord. Every congregation should reproduce after kind. And there also may come some people who are not called to co collaborate with you at some point. If such people come properly, there should be no crisis. There should be no crisis. If they say the Lord has called them to another walk, release them joyfully. Lay hands on them. Pray for them. But if they lied about it, if their problem is that they don't want to stay and fulfill their years of being under authority, they don't want to give, they say, oh, all this time I'm serving somebody. Let me go and serve myself. Let me start my own church. Remember Luke 16, 12. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? That's a question Yeshua asked. The church is his own. If the Lord brings you to serve with a man or woman of God, do that as unto the Lord. Sam, don't stay there and be plotting and planning. You see that brother, he has a good car. You see that brother, is a good title. If only I have these five people, I can start my own. And you are plotting to eat their heart every time you are going to give them a word, a word, a word. You know what? The Lord sees your agenda. It is corrupt. It's corrupt. It is corrupt. And so, men and brethren, there is a right way of doing things. In the book of Acts 13, we see how people were separated from a walk. Now, they were in the church that was at Antioch. Certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Asia, and Lucius of Cyrene, a man in which had been brought up with Herod, Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Paul and Saul, 
for the walk whereunto I have called them. Holy Ghost spoke clearly. In an ideal setting, the Lord should speak so clearly that both the visionary and the person who is going, being called to another walk will hear it. And what happens? When they fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia from thence they sailed to Cyrus. Are you sent by Holy Ghost? Or did you go to do your own thing? For seven years you've been toiling and toiling. It looks like nothing has happened. Have you ever thought whether your foundation is wrong? Have you ever thought to go back to the person you came out from and say, I'm so sorry, the way I acted, I, I dishonored you before the people, then I went out in anger to start my church. Please forgive me. Submit yourself and for him to pray and forgive you and release you. Why is it that people are hard-hearted in this generation? You see what you are doing. Evidently, the hand of the Lord is not in it. And people do not, are not sensitive to say, ha, ah, what is my foundation in ministry? Did I take people out from that church like that? What is the thing that I'm doing that is not right? Men and brethren, there's a right way of being released from a congregation. There's a wrong way. Do things the right way, proper way, and you'll prosper. So the teaching process is not an invitation for people to do whatever they like. It's not an invitation for people to go and break up church because you've been trained, you've been ordained, then you run off. No. If you do so, you are lacerating the body. Let's say you are healing evangelists by calling. When you pray for people to get their healing and the Lord is mightily, then you run off from a church that is trying to be fivefold and they just try to achieve it. You run off to start XYZ evangelistic ministries. You know what you have done? You are lacerating the body. You are tearing up the body. You have lacerated this one. Where you are going, you are not fivefold either. So here bad, they're bad. That's not the way to do things. The Lord is in the business of healing his broken body. Dry bones, bringing them together, bone to bone, sinew upon sinew, flesh upon flesh, so that each congregation is complete in the fivefold. Let's stop tearing apart what the Lord is building up. Let's stop claiming in his name, committing sin in his name, lying in the name, not being afraid to say, Holy Ghost told you, how can he tell you to tear up the fivefold and break what the Lord is building and go and start something and it's only you because you want power, you want money, you want prominence, you want position. Why are we saying this? There are people who have turned the TTA into another thing. They are taught Train, they equip, they activated, and when they are released, they begin to have ideas. Starting from the door of ordination, their relatives will tell them, Well, you start your own church. No, tell your relatives it's not about church. I'm not called as a pastor, I'm called as a teacher, I'm called as an evangelist, I'm called as a prophet. We are part of a fivefold. We are, are being released to serve alongside others. Tell them boldly. Don't let people speak into your ear things that are not profitable and then you, you don't know those things they've spoken can begin to work in you. Don't let your spouse push you to go and start a church. Don't let your friends start to push you. There's a right way of doing things. There's a wrong way. Now we come to the end. Assignment number one. What truth struck you most in the orientation presentation today? What truth struck you most? Two, kindly share three other things you are taking away from this lesson. And having said that, men and brethren, there are some bad days today and there's a marriage anniversary. Our brother and our sister, Apostle Albert and Apostle Chiwe Obadei, the overseers of Foundation Ministries in Ennis Island and members of the Global Executive Council, the Global Executive Director for Mobilization of IMF Worldwide. Today is their 27th wedding anniversary. And right now they are in Dubai, you know, holiday in, sponsored by their own daughter, first daughter, Jemima, who is, lives in Dubai. Praise the Lord for Apostle Albert and Apostle Chimwe. May the Lord bless you. Today is also the birthday of Rose Njala, the Deputy President of IMF Kenya, along with her husband, Pastor Dixon Juma of Eldoret. Today is also the birthday of her brother, Dequalo Johnson, an alumna of GPRC who lives in Dallas, Texas. Today is also the birthday of Antoinette Belsenhorn of South Africa. Brothers and sisters, we want to now sign off and we are thankful to the Lord for Pastor Grace.